so that way people can hear online. Uh, welcome. My name is Sandra Delvad, and I'm the Director of Guidance and Counseling for Harlingen School District. And we're pleased that we have Dr. Javier Cavazos here with us. And he is going to be talking about identifying symptoms of depression and cultivating positive emotions among adolescents. Um, Dr. Cavazos is an Associate Dean for Research and Graduate uh, Programs in the College of Education and P16 Integration at UTRGV. He has been part of 70 peer-reviewed publications and collaborated on grants over $5 million. And when he is not writing or teaching, he enjoys spending time with his family and his daughter. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Javier Cavazos. And again, thank you. I'm glad that you're here um, in New Harlingen. You know, I don't know what it is. This is the second time that we've had Dr. Cavazos out. There's more people here tonight. So thank you for coming out. We do know that our, our students do suffer from depression. And so I'm glad that y'all are here to hear this vital information. Thank you, Ms. Uh, so, uh, good evening, everybody, and good evening to those of us joining on the World Wide Web. Um, I'm very, um, very pleased to be here. As, as she mentioned, I currently work at UT Rio Grande Valley. I have multiple roles. I'm also a licensed professional counselor. Um, right now, I'm not uh, using my counseling license because I'm doing other things, um, but that, that, that's a little bit about, about who I am. So. I am very pleased, happy to be here to have a conversation with you all. Um, because we have people uh, interacting with us on, on the web, through live stream, um, we're probably gonna keep our interaction in here to a minimum, because it wouldn't be <laughs> fair to the people on live stream, but just please know that um, usually my conversations are, are very interactive. I'm gonna ask you to think, to reflect, to write, uh, it's just to just to think about some of the things we're going to talk about um, about about today. So a little bit about who I am, because I think it's important for you all to know a little bit about the the person leading the the conversation tonight. Um, you see up there a uh, picture of Bella Panthers. My cousin Brianna Bella is in the room. She works uh, here for, for Harlingen. So the Bella Middle School is named after my or our late grandfather Moises V. Bella. So my ties to Harlingen. Are, are very strong. I live right now in Edinburgh, but I, I grew up here. I went to Long Elementary, and they have a school named after my, my grandfather, my, my Uncle Manny, Brianna's um, father, has a very important role with Valley Baptist. So I always enjoy coming back to Harlem June. I promise you I have <laughs> uh, multiple roles at, in Edinburgh at ETRGV, but I'm, I'm always excited to get back here to have a conversation with, 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 with parents, with students, with, with, with people in general. So that's, that's a little bit about me. The, 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 the more important one, at least for this, this conversation, is um, this, this image right, right here. And I hope everybody listening through live stream can see it. Um, you know, somebody earlier shared a story with me that just, you know, just not, it's, it's tough. This, this conversation is hard. And I am not here, um, as, as an expert, I'm not, I'm not here telling everybody what to do. I, I am here with you in the conversation and, 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 and in the battle. I have a, that's my three and a half year old. Um, so those of you who have children um, at various ages, I, I'm here talking with you as a parent. I'm not here talking to you as an expert in mental health because I'm, I'm not. I'm here just, my role is just to get, get us thinking about some of these things and some of the things that we could be doing because I, I promise you, when my daughter gets to a certain age, um, I'm gonna ask her tough questions. Uh, I'm going to try my very best to, to, to protect her, to keep her happy. And even that, that I, I, might, I might fail. I, I might fail in terms of her, her, her mental health and her happiness, and that's, that's scary. That is tough. So what I wanna tell y'all is, I, I'm, I'm with y'all in, in the journey. I am with y'all in, in loving our children, and I love, that you all are here in person or online. I don't, I don't know if she mentioned that. She, they might get upset for me mentioning this, but we had this conversation last semester and <laughs> uh, not a lot of people came. So the fact that you're here shows me that you're, you're interested in this topic because you unconditionally love your children your, your, your child and you wanna figure out how, how, can you, how can you help them. So again, my role is just to create space 
to, 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 to think about, about these things. Right? So my, my role is to, 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 to get you thinking about it, but I'm a big fan of, 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 of objectives. There's got to be a point, there's got to be a purpose to these conversations. Otherwise, it's just me lecturing for an hour and 15 minutes, and I don't want to do that. I, I still teach, and I, I don't lecture. I, I, I lecture a little bit, and then we interact and we reflect. But hopefully tonight, in these next hour and 15 minutes or so, these are two things that I hope you'll take away. Number one, very important, I hope you'll take away a better understanding of characteristics of depression. As we'll talk about, there's about five to seven of them. Sometimes there aren't any warning signs. Sometimes things just pop up, and that's, that's scary. But with, this, with these things, at least, at least we'll be able to know that if somebody's going through one thing, we need to be alert that maybe a couple of other things are, are coming along the way. And perhaps the, most, the, the more important part of this conversation, uh, last Friday, I won't say where I was, I was at a five-hour uh, five training on a similar topic, and they talked to us a lot about depression and anxiety for five hours. Five straight hours, straight, straight. But there was no conversation on the other side of the mental health continuum. There was no conversation on happiness, positive emotions. So the, the last part of this conversation is going to be on positive emotions and happiness. Because I promise you, not everybody agrees with this, but a lot of my colleagues do, and a lot of research I've read um, confirms this. Just because you or your kids or us, and I'm going to say we, just because we're not fully depressed does not mean we're fully 100% happy. So I don't want you to look at this conversation as, all right, let's wait till my son or daughter is depressed. No. Let's do these things tonight. Let's do these things tomorrow. Why can't we go from good or okay to better or excellent? There's no reason to wait, like many of us do, to go to the doctor or dentist when there's a problem. And I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. So what I'm asking us to do is, wherever you are at, wherever your children are at, let's help them get a little better. Okay? So the final point before we get going, and where I'm going to ask you to start thinking and doing some of these things, I, I fully understand that this conversation is for your children. 100%. Totally understand that. However, I will tell you this. Uh, every now and then I get on an airplane, and if you've ever been on an airplane, they, the flight attendants come on and they talk to you about the, the air mask if it ever comes down for breathing. They always tell us that you need to put those things on ourselves first. Isn't that right? Before our children. So the point is this. All of these things we're going to talk about today, we can do them to help ourselves first. Because I'm a firm believer, if we as parents are sad or depressed or a little not ourselves, it's going to be hard to, to help our children. Okay, so that's, that's where we're at today. So hopefully you'll take away these, these two things. So, again, we can't call the people a live stream, right? So I, to be fair to them, um, I'm not going to call anybody, but for the next 30 seconds, I just want you to think, what are symptoms of depression? Just 30 seconds, and then somebody will tell me when it's time to up, right? 30 seconds. I know, I, I'm always, uh, I have an issue with silence, <laughs> I really do. But it, again, if we didn't have people, I want to be mindful and respectful of the people online. Um, we would have a little conversation. Really, I, the point of this activity is just to, to tell you this, that I'm not an expert. All of you have your own experiences, conceptions of what depression is, what, what symptoms they look like. I'm just here to kind of connect and bring all of that together. My hunch is, a lot of you probably thought of depression, one symptom of depression is sadness or crying. Right? That's, my, that's my hunch that a lot of you probably thought about that. You're absolutely right. Those are the two big indicators of depression. What if I told you there's five others that are just as important, that are just as meaningful, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But before I do that, I want to share this. So my cousin's in the room, and she'll probably tell my, our grandmother this, but that's okay. You know, my grandmother, Mary, Mary, Mary Jo Bella, very, very awesome, awesome woman. 
You know, she uh, goes to H-E-B quite a bit, and <laughs> Brano will, will attest to this. When, right before she pays, she always buys a magazine. All the time, she always buys a magazine. A lot of us buy Time magazine, you know, very reputable magazine with important stories. Not my grandmother. My grandmother buys the National Enquirer, right? The, the Star. The, the, and she swears that those are credible stories. And I'm not going to get into that, right? But the point is this. Time Magazine, very prominent national magazine about a year and a half ago, had this on their front cover, which shows me and tells me that this is a very important issue. And the cover read this. Anxiety, depression, and the modern adolescent. That tells me that our children, your children, are going through quite a bit in terms of mental health. And there's various reasons for that, but we've seen a huge trend in the number of adolescents who are dealing with mental health issues. A couple of reasons for that are social media is one contributing factor, just one, right? Not cause and effect, just a contributing factor. And the easiest example is this. A lot of what's on social media is a little negative, right? Last November, before I presented at the parent workshop here in, in Harlingen, we were at South Padre Island for a conference, and this, I promise you, the last thing my wife, don't tell Alyssa, <laughs> the last thing my wife showed me before we went to sleep was an image from her Facebook page of a young girl who had died due to starvation. That was the last image I had in my mind before I went to bed. Another example, when kids, or even adults, my wife in particular, she just told me today, don't share any more stories. Ah, you know, I regress, <laughs> that's okay. She posts something on Facebook, two hours later, she checks how many people liked it. Oh my gosh, my Theo, my uncle, my aunt didn't like the post. So what do you think she starts thinking? She gets a little sad because some people aren't supporting her. The same thing with our children. I am not saying that social media causes depression. It's just part of the conversation. The other big factor, and you all know this, our kids are being asked to do a lot more. They're being asked to get involved in a lot of different things. I hear kids in, in, in elementary stressed out from a lot of homework. I'm not knocking homework. It's just something that we need to keep in mind, that our kids are working at school, eight to three or eight to four, and then having to do a lot of homework, extracurricular activities, sports, band, etc. So it's just something to be mindful about, that our kids, the modern adolescent, are being asked to do a lot more, and perhaps with a little less resources. So here, here, back to the symptoms of depression. That last slide was kind of um, why depression is important. So here are the symptoms. You all mentioned, you all, my hunch is that you all thought of um, sadness and, and crying and tears, 100%. Those are the first two. Here's the other one, and this might make sense once you think about it. Diminished interest or pleasure in activities. What does that mean? Here's what that looks like. You, your child, eighth grader, always, every weekend, goes out with his friends, plays basketball every weekend. Then one weekend, he doesn't want to go play basketball anymore. All right, maybe something came up. Two weekends, he doesn't want to play basketball. That should tell you something's not right because when people are depressed, they stop doing the things that they enjoy doing. It's a huge red flag. As I'll talk about later on, I, I lost my mom in, in May for about four or five days. I, I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to lie in bed, just wanted to grieve, be by myself. That's fine. The key number for us in here with our children or even ourselves is 14 days. If these things that we're going to discuss today persist for 14 days, there could be a, a, a serious problem. So again, the 14 days is important. If you lose somebody or your child breaks up with a significant other, they're going to grieve. That's natural. That's normal. We expect that. If it lasts for more than 14 days, that could be an indicator of, of depression. So again, the simplest thing you could do with your kids is notice what are their activities that they enjoy doing, and when they stop doing that, just ask them, what happened? Why don't you want to do that anymore? And I'm not talking about those transition periods when our kids want to go to a playground, all of a sudden they want to go to the movies. That's a little different. Um, we're talking about when people enjoy doing things 
and they stop, that could be a serious red flag that something is, something is going on. So those are the first two. Here are the other ones that not everybody thinks about. And it'll make sense to you, I promise. It'll make sense. But sometimes we don't think about it. The one on the left. And, we'll, and you, you'll see that I use a lot of images in my PowerPoint presentation. And the reason I do that is because I'm responsible for leading professional development workshops on, on best practices in teaching. And I know in teaching, now I know, that when people see a presentation, it's more effective for learning when they see an image and they hear the facilitator share a story, as opposed to throwing up 200 words on the, on the PowerPoint and you all get confused and annoyed because do you read the PowerPoint or do you listen to me? So that's why I have a lot of images and I share stories about it. So the one on the left, that's a person sleeping, that's a person in bed. We know when people are depressed, they tend to want to sleep for long periods of time. And again, I know I'm gonna sound like a parrot, but I'm gonna say this again. If your child goes through something significant and wants to sleep for three or four days, fine, let them, let them grieve, let them be alone, let them cope, let them think. That's good, that's healthy. If it persists for two weeks or more, then there's a problem. If somebody's in bed for two weeks, there's a serious problem. If somebody's in bed, like on the left, they're probably not eating as well, which is the other indicator of depression. I've been depressed defined by 14 or more days with five or more of these symptoms twice in my life. The first time, I weighed 210 pounds. In two weeks, I lost 13.5 pounds. It was crazy because I could not eat. Physically, it hurt to put food into my mouth and to hold the food down. I'm sharing this with you because that's what that could look like. So if your children lose a significant amount of weight in a short amount of time, it's just perhaps something to, to, to look into, to, 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 to explore, and to, to be concerned about. And somebody reminded me, I, I presented this last, um, last semester, somebody reminded me very nicely. They said, what about the other side? If people are depressed, can they eat too much? Yes, 100%. And all of you in the room have seen movies. I'm not going to pick on women, because there's a lot of women here. <laughs> I'll pick on men, even though it's the other way around, right? We've all seen movies where people break up, they cry, they're sad, they go to the refrigerator, and what do they get? Ice cream. They get a bucket, a bowl of ice cream, and that's what that comes into. We all react differently. I lose weight. Some people gain weight because they're, they're so nervous that they're just putting everything into their mouth, right? So this one, this is the, this is the last one on, on depression. This one's tough. You know, I, ah, you know, sorry, live stream. Um, this one's tough for me, personally. You see an image on the right. This is a gentleman, uh, college football quarterback at Washington State. If anybody in here or online likes sports, which I do, you know that sports, college sports is big time, big time money, big time success, big time fame. That guy looks like the happiest guy in the world. Right? Nothing can go wrong, looks happy. What if I told you that gentleman, unfortunately, uh, committed suicide a year and a half ago? No warning signs, nothing. We all thought he was happy. He had the world by his tail, starting quarterback for a major college football program. No warning signs. Incredibly sad, um, in tragic end to, to his life. And I mention that because I want us to make a connection to, to what this can end up, um, and a big indicator of depression is this recurrent thought of, of death, not wanting to be here anymore. Now here's where I might say something controversial, and some people don't like it. And like my grandfather, grandfather used to tell me, I'll, I'll just tell them to go jump in the lake. No, I'm just like, I'm just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. With all due respect to anybody in the room, let me share, let me share this. When my daughter gets to 12 years old or 11, I need to think about the age. But when she gets to around 11 or 12, 
if I sense that she has a couple of these significant indicators of depression, I am going to ask her the most important question I could ask her. Are you thinking of harming yourself? Are you thinking of killing yourself? Do you want to die? Not everybody likes hearing me say that. Because people think, if I ask them that, that's going to give them the idea to do it. And that's not true. That is a myth. They're already thinking of it. The research I've read and the colleagues I work with, they value those questions because it shows people, hey, I care about you to ask this question. And you know what, honestly, I only think Brianna knows this. My grandmother, about a year and a half ago, when I was kind of in a tough place because my mom passed away, she asked me that exact same question. She asked me, are you thinking of harming yourself? And I told her no, I told her no, I love life, I love my daughter. But the fact that she asked that told me that, you know, she cared, that she sensed I was a little unhappy, a little sad, and that uh, perhaps I needed to get a little uh, help with, 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 with somebody. So the point is this, if you've never asked that question, you know, when you drive home tonight, just let it come out of your mouth. It is, it is tough. It is ugly. It feels ugly. I even hate saying it here. But that's, that's my role as a licensed professional counselor. Every uh, initial session I have with a client or a student or adolescent, if I sense that person is struggling, I have to ask that question. So 100% I'm going to ask my daughter when she gets there um, to that point. Because the, the research I've read does not support the idea that if we ask it, it's going to give people the idea. That's not true. All it's doing is creating space to have that important conversation of death, life, living, and most importantly, as we'll talk about in a minute, hope and reasons for living. And the last one here, the top one, feelings of worthlessness. I've had conversations with kids where they tell me they, they, they're, they're unworthy. They, they don't know why they're here. That is tough to hear. But as we'll see with the gentleman on the right, sometimes people don't project that. Sometimes people don't, don't share that. Sometimes people don't, don't want to let people in. But I'm here telling you that when your kids, and I say when because all of us um, are not immune to depression. Some, it's going to hit us at some point. When our children get to a certain point and they're a little sad, you know, just ask those questions. And if you don't want to ask the death question, then ask the other question. What are some of your reasons for living? Why do you want to be here? Then flip it on the positive side. Get them to tell you why they want to be here. And if all they tell you is, is that you're the only person um, that they're holding on to, then you know what, that's a start. What we don't want to hear is that they have no reason or no hope to, to live. Um, I know the people online, I, I can't see y'all, but I sense in the room that, that this, was, this is tough, right? It is brutal. Uh, going home tonight, I'm going to reflect, and it's tough. I, I don't even, I, I can't even fathom thinking of my daughter and, and suicide. I mean, I don't know how else to say that. I, I would, I would struggle to, 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 to go on. So I know your roles are, are, are very important. And, and the last one, then we'll move on to, to, to happiness. And I have this in quote. A lot of, some people who show the depression, they say, I don't want to be here anymore. That's a big time quote. And here's the other statement. Now, if you ever write down anything on depression, here it is. And again, not everybody agrees with me, and that's all right. Um, most people who attempt or commit suicide do not want to die. They just want to eliminate the pain that they're going through here in life. And that's the only way they think they can escape the pain which is fine. I am not here judging anybody because I know life is hard, life is tough, life, life sucks sometimes. So the people who do commit or attempt, they're telling us that they're going through something so severe that they would, that they would potentially say goodbye to people. And I have this image up here, better things are coming for a reason. Sometimes it's not, it's, it's not that easy. And I'm not here telling y'all, never tell anybody, oh yeah, better things are coming, have faith. I'm not Hallmark, I'm not Hallmark, and that's, that's Hallmark, right? What I would tell you is this, and you all can appreciate, is that believing better things are coming is a daily battle. You know, it is not a switch, there's no change to Channel 5. It is a daily battle, daily struggle 
to condition ourselves to move toward a path where potentially better things might come. I, I hate when people tell me when people tell me stories that my counselor told me I need to get over my son's death. It's been 18 months and she told me it's been too long. Why? 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 Grief, depression is individual. We should never tell people that. What we will tell people is maybe there's a couple of things we could do to maybe make us feel a little happier, but that doesn't mean that we need to tell people to stop being depressed. And the last one on depression. I, 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 Brianna knows this, my cousin over here. I love my grandfather. I, I miss him every day. You know, I miss him every, every day. I, I, I think he was the most near perfect person I've ever met. But one thing, <laughs> uh, one thing that, that I struggled with him was on his uh, views toward, toward mental health. And I think my grandmother would probably attest to this. He always taught me to, I don't know how to say this, to, to toughen up, you know, to be strong, you're, you're a man, you need to be strong, you need to deal with mental health on your own. Don't go to a counselor, don't let other people hear your problems, things like that. Right? And that's because I love him, I revere him, respect him, right? and, I, and I get where he's coming from. But I'm here telling you the exact opposite. I'm here telling you this image, right, that it's okay to not be okay. That depression is, is normal. I, I always gauge the audience. I never know what audience members are going to think. But the people I talk to, the people I work with, I sense that they're still a little... It's gotten better. I sense that there's still a stigma around mental health. That if I go see a counselor, that must mean I'm crazy or something's not right. And that's not true. That's why I want us to move toward that. Why can't we go to counseling when we want to make things better? Why wait? And I just said this. Why wait when there's a problem when we want to we want to get better when we're doing okay? So the point is this: this little this little guy on the left saying, "I'm not okay." I'm depressed, I'm sad. Wouldn't it be great if all of us in this world say, that's okay, instead of saying, you need to toughen up, you need to move on. Your, your son, your daughter passed away 18 months ago. Your mom passed away eight months ago. You need to move on. No, we need people to tell us that that's okay and that's, that's all right. All right. So this is, I always have my little lectures plugged, ready to go, you know, every 20 minutes, because I know that it's hard for people to maintain cognitive engagement for longer than 20 minutes, right? So it's like a little mental, mental break. Uh, if we didn't have people online, I would ask you to, to, to write and we talk a little bit, but since to be respectful to people there. Um, what I want you to do is just for 30 seconds, just a minute, I want you, like that image says, to make a personal connection to what we just talked about. That could be you, you've known somebody who's depressed, your, your, your child was depressed a little bit, you've been depressed. I just want you to make that personal connection because that will make the last part of this a little more meaningful. I've already shared several examples of my personal connection to the topic, and I just want you to think about it for 30 seconds. Right. The people online too. Again, that was just a pause, a way for you to connect to the material. And again, um, a lot of presentations that I hear or, or see, they, they end with this slide. And they just talk about depression and, and that's it. And that, that's only half of it. What about the other half, which is this? And I am not here shifting in an abrupt manner to tell everybody it is easy. No, it's not. It is not easy. I have family in the room, and I'm gonna be as open and transparent as I can. My daughter's three and a half. You, those of you who are parents, you know how your kids behave certain days at three and a half. Sometimes they don't want to go to bed. Sometimes they don't want to get in the car seat. Sometimes they don't want to brush their teeth. 
right? So I'm not here saying, oh yeah, do, do these eight things, it's so easy, it's so simple. No, 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 no. It's very hard when your daughter's throwing a tantrum to think, oh, what did Javier say to express gratitude? No, it's very hard. So what I'm sharing with you is that it's very difficult to do all these things. And I don't like when people tell me it's easy to just do this, this, and this. It's a quick thing. It is not. It is not. It takes practice to, to do a lot of these things. So here's what we'll do now. Another 30 seconds, right? Javier, you see the Scrabble over there? Right, 30 seconds. And again, if we add more time or want to be mindful of everybody, we do other things with coloring and writing and those things. But just think, what are the symptoms of happiness? Just 30 seconds. And if the people in the room, if you want to show me the symptoms, I'll be good too. Okay. All right. So, thank you. My hunch is a lot of you probably thought of smiles, smiles, and happiness. You probably, you, you never want to describe a word with a word in it, right? But you probably thought happy, maybe joy. It wouldn't be cool if we all went to bed at night thinking of happy things instead of negative, what's wrong with the world things. Not that those things don't exist. I always make this joke about the news. Can't make it today, right? Not channel 23, what about channel four? We go with channel four. I'll never forget my grandparents, especially my grandfather, he would watch, sorry, Derek. He would watch channel four <laughs> until he met Derek Garcia. He would watch channel, channel four 10 o'clock news every night without fail. Since I was watching with him, 10 o'clock, the first five stories were a little negative, more negative, more negative, more negative. Crime, crime, crime. And then the last one was a, was a robbery or something. Those are the last images he had before he went to sleep. So what I'm asking us to think about, and it is not easy, right, when your children, when our children don't behave, it is not easy. What if we reshifted that to think about the positive things right before we go to bed, right before we wake up in the morning? Some people get mad at me at this point. They say, you're telling us to ignore all the negative things. You're telling us to ignore that my child is getting bullied at school. We, it's hard to pay the bills. I'm not telling you that. There's no way I'm telling you that. All I'm saying is let's bring something else into the conversation. We can talk about our problems, but why can't we talk about the happy things too? So here's the final part of this little conversation. So you see on here, you see this wonderful slide with, with, with emojis, right? See, I, don't, I haven't counted them, but there's like, there's about 15 in there. 14 of them are sad, negative, gloomy, whatever you want to call it. One of them is the smiley face. So that's what I'm going to ask you to reflect on and think about for the next 20 minutes or so. Yeah, we all have 14 or 15 negative things. I just got 14 or 15 negative things in an email. Right? I'm not saying let's ignore that. What's that one positive thing that we can all hold on to? And let me preface it with this. All of these come in, 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 in a respectable timing. Nobody wants to go to a funeral. They just lost their mom or their son or their daughter. And the next day, oh, Javier told us that we need to have gratitude. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. When we are ready, these are the things that we can consider doing. These are the things that we can consider practicing. And I promise you, they're all based on research. So it's not just me pulling them out of my hat. This is me doing a lot of research, reading a lot of articles and books, synthesizing it, and putting them into eight key things that we can consider, consider doing. And it's cool that y'all are here, because I think y'all are in the next picture, right? Nice. So here we go, eight, there's eight. Hopefully you can take one. Maybe you're already doing it. My point to you is this. Just do more of it. I talk a lot to people, especially to college faculty, 
hope nobody's over there on the line, right? And they always, somebody always says, oh, I know this, I'm already doing it. My response is, that's great. Give me your name and number next time you can co-present with me. No, I don't tell them that. <laughs> My point is, why can't you just do more of it? Right, so here's the first one. And again, this is not easy. I'm not here telling you that this is, this is a cookbook. Turn to page 55 and do this. That is not what I'm saying. When you're ready, emotionally, these are some of the things you can consider. And I promise you, even up here, it's not easy for me to look at this picture, but I know that these things are important. So number eight, there's eight of them. Celebrate your lost loved ones, okay? We know that us as adults, kids, when we lose somebody, that's very sad. I know a lot of your kids in here are very close to grandparents. It's a given they're close to you. It's a given you love them. A lot of kids, depending on their grandparents' health, they lose grandparents at, at, at a certain age. It is brutal. It is tough. And I'm not here telling you the day at the funeral, tell them, celebrate your grandfather. No. I'm telling you, when they're ready, a month, two months, whenever, find ways to celebrate them. This here is one of my favorite pictures because the person in the middle, that's my grandfather. No, my grandmother doesn't like showing a famous judge and attorney with, in that picture, you know, but that's, that's us, that's real. And what I love about it is because we're taking a selfie, everybody's happy, and my grandfather's trying to, to talk on the phone. He said some derogatory terms afterwards, right? Like, just be quiet so he can talk on the phone. It took me a while, it took me a while, but I, I have this uh, pendulum, or I don't know what you call it, that he wore in the Korean War in 1952. And when he passed away, my grandmother gave it to me, not because I'm the closest one to them, because I was the only one who was still Catholic among the children. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. Actually, I'm not playing, but anyway, anyway, anyway. It took me a while to put it on, because I knew when I put it on, I was gonna have a lot of memories, and I was gonna think about a lot of things. So whenever you or your children lose somebody, find ways to celebrate them. Whatever that looks like will be very unique and different, and it, it's not easy. If you never do, that is fine. That is okay. That tells me that it's too painful to go there, and that is 100% okay. But if you can't get there, Think of how we can celebrate them. Number seven, number seven. This is, this is my favorite. So your kids are gonna graduate from high school and then college. Notice I said that to all of y'all, right? I didn't say just high school, I said high school and college. Hopefully, I want everybody in here to go to college. When you graduate from high school or college, they have a commencement speaker who shares like words of wisdom. 5% of the audience pays attention, right? The first time I heard this quote, I was one of the 5% I was, and I was not paying attention. I was like, all right, you're citing Dr. Seuss, whatever, let me just get on, to, on my phone. Then I heard it again, caught my attention. Then I heard the third time at a commencement speech. That's when I, it really hit me. And the quote's this, don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened. And that taps into how we think. If you take any, anything away from today's conversation, it's this. Our thinking influences our emotions and feelings and depression more than anything else. And I firmly believe that based on everything I've read. What does that look like? T typically, when we are sad, I said typically, not all the time, we are responding to our thoughts about a situation. And how does, how does that quote relate to that? I just showed you on the last slide, it's not easy for me to talk about. My grandfather, our grandfather, passed away, right? Passed away. Don't cry because it's over. Don't cry because he's not here anymore. Smile because of you got to spend 33, 33 years of your life with him. Be grateful for the 33 years that you had him, not the years that you weren't able to have him. That's when I made a connection, and that's what that quote could mean. But that quote could not look like that the day at his funeral, the day after his funeral. I don't want to hear that. 
just let me be sad, let me grieve. But eventually, I got to a point where I was, I, I won't say I wasn't sad anymore, but I was able to accept and appreciate all the wonderful times I had, had with him. So for us, for our children, connected to thinking, whenever your child is going through sadness or depression, ask them, or ask him or her, sorry, my wife would hate that I just said that. I have a daughter, right? <laughs> him or her, ask him or her, what are you thinking about the situation? And maybe that might give you a clue as to why they're a little depressed or a little sad. They, they, they have a breakup. They might be thinking the world is over, I'm never gonna find anybody, etc. right? Just give them space to have those thoughts. And then your role as parents, or our role as parents, is just to help them change those thoughts to, to something a little more positive. That's what that looks like. And that's, that one's my favorite. Here's one very practical. Some of you may already know this. We have, in counseling, a beautiful and wonderful system to diagnose people and, 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 and children. You come see me, my role is the very first session I gotta find out what's wrong with you. That's my role according to the Texas State Board of Licensor, Licensing, sorry. That's my role, to diagnose somebody with depression, anxiety, etc. I wish my role, and my role is this, but I wish my role would be mandated to do this, is to find out what people are good at, to find out what people's character strengths are. So here is, it's called a values in action classification of character strengths. Free, takes 10 minutes to complete. You or your kids, I would tell you to have your kids fill it out. All you do, all they do is answer questions about what they like, what they're good at, what are their hobbies, what they value. And you know what shoots up? Shouldn't shoot, I shouldn't say shoot up in a high, sorry. That's not what I meant. What pops up is this. You get a list of your top five character strengths. And our role as parents is just to help kids cultivate those strengths into their everyday life. So what does that look like? And I promise you, if you wanna stay behind, I'll give you the link, but if you just Google values in action, classification strengths, you'll, you'll find it very easy, very easy, I promise you. What does that look like? So I never ask people to do something that I would not do myself. I've done this several times and my strengths have changed several times. It took me 15 minutes. So I did this about, about two months ago and they have 24 strengths and it gave me a list of my top five. And here are my top five. Perseverance, gratitude, appreciation of beauty, curiosity, and, and, and humor. I know what y'all are thinking. Number five, humor, it's not my strength. All right, I get that, that's fine, that's fair. But the first four are, so you're probably thinking, how is this related to depression? Well, here, here, here's the connection. When people are sad or depressed, remember I said, they stop doing the things that they're interested in or that they enjoy doing. So your role as parents, if I was sad or depressed, you would ask me, when is the last time you expressed gratitude to somebody, which is my number two strength? I would tell you, the last time I expressed gratitude in a meaningful way was three months ago when I wrote a letter to my wife's mother. That's what I would tell you. You would ask me, appreciation of beauty. When's the last time you appreciated beauty? I love birds. I love parks. I love nature. I have not gone to see birds in, in, in quite a long time. So the point is that when people are sad or depressed, maybe they forget doing these things. Maybe they, maybe they don't even know that some of these are their strengths. Our role is just to help people cultivate them, which means get them doing this every day, every day, to, to use these things. But sometimes we don't think about that. And I get it, I'm not knocking anybody. I, so tomorrow morning I might forget about some of these things. But when I'm at my best in mental health, I'm doing these things. I'm allowing myself to laugh, to be curious, and to appreciate nature. I mean, when's the last time in the morning, we, we wake up and just appreciate the, the, sun, the sunrise. I have a friend who texts me quite a bit in the morning. It's gonna be an ugly day. There's three clouds out there, it's windy. 
You know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear. All right, it's windy. There's three clouds. Well, what's good about the day? You know, that's that's the point of it. So I promise you, you don't have to believe me. Go to the website, take it, and just just see what pops up. Those of you who are parents, it would be cool for you to reflect on these things and see what are you good at, and then the most important question: How can you do more of that? Okay. So. Uh, you see, I, I, thought I, I thought I had a pause in here. Nope. All right. So, number five, moving right along. This is a home stretch. Stay with me. These are, these are just tough photos, you know. They're, they're, I, 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 I never know how I'm going to react to seeing them, but I'm, I, I do that to be authentic with, 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 with all of you. Number five is connect with others. When people are sad or depressed, they want to do, we want to do the exact opposite. We want to be in bed, we want to be by ourselves, we want to isolate ourselves from the world. At least that's what I do and that's what a lot of my colleagues and the people I work with want to do. So this slide is to, I know it's hard, to pick ourselves up out of bed and find ways to connect with others. And I'm not here telling you one week, two weeks, there's no time frame on these things. When you're ready, when your kid is ready, when your child is ready to connect with people. I used to go to the nursing home. My grandfather was at Rotama Manor for a year and a half, right, more or less. People at Rotama would always ask me in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, but I knew what they said. They would always ask me if I had a job, because <laughs> I was always there during the day. And I, I typically teach at night, so that's why I, I work at night. But they always ask me that. But I did that because, especially in the, the, last, the last months before he passed, I knew it was going to be very hard. I wanted to be in bed. I wanted to cry. I wanted to be sad. But I knew it was important for me to connect with him as much as possible. After the funeral, and you all can, all, I know you all can appreciate this, once everybody leaves who comes for a funeral, we all want to disconnect and we want to be by ourselves. And that's how I was. And that's how your kids might be. And what I'm telling you is, that's okay. But once it gets to two weeks, 14 days is your number to be aware of that there might be a problem. When my mom passed away and everybody left, I was in bed for, I think I shared this story, I was in bed three days. I asked my wife very kindly, my daughter was out of daycare because it was May. I asked my daughter very kindly, I met my wife very kindly. I was just gonna sound rude, but this is what I needed. Um, can you, my wife's name is Alyssa. Alyssa, can you take Elixia to your parents just for, just for the day, just so I can be in bed and do nothing but watch TV and just reflect on my mom. And my wife was awesome. She allowed me that space. But there was, a, there was a point, there was a moment where I know that I needed to reconnect with people. I needed to get back to work to reconnect. What I'm here telling you is, if your number is 12 days, 11 days, that's, that's, that's all right. There's no, there's no time frame on these things. If you never reconnect, I would never judge you. No way. The world might, some people might, your boss might, I would never judge you because I don't know what you've gone through. I don't know the loss and the grief you feel. But we know that if we want to feel a little better, it might be important to connect with others. And we define others as the people who are important to you. Not defining others as get on Facebook and connect with people who you've never even seen. They just accept your friend request. Right? That's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about your family and your friends who you consider family. Ah, there was a pause. So, this just keeps getting tougher and tougher. Alright, number four, identify hope. I, 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 I'm sad to, to even say this because I've worked with people who tell me they've, they have no hope. And that's the worst, aside from somebody telling me they, their son or daughter has taken their life, Hearing somebody say they have no hope is the worst thing I've ever heard because I know hope is one of the biggest factors of mental health among children and adolescents. 
you all define hope probably very differently. Hope is very individual. Some people, I don't even know what hope is, but I know what hope looks like. Like all of you in this room, I bet hope looks like your, your child or your children, right? When times get tough, when, when we want to quit, and I, I want to quit every now and then too, we probably hold on to, well, what is it that, that gives me hope? And I'm going to say this, and I don't want to be disrespectful to anybody, but for some of us, and I see a, a Cowboys hat, and I'm not saying this is you, but for me, sports gives me hope. I vicariously live through sports in, in weird and strange ways that seeing the athletes persevere somehow gives me hope. And it's, it's strange, but my fascination with sports runs beyond entertainment. It's seeing people persist, get back up, and, and, and go through things. But for you all, ask your children how they define hope, what does hope look like, and ask them the most important question ever. What gives you hope? What is your hope for the future? Those are the most important questions. And hopefully your children don't say, I have no hope, because that's, that's the, one of the biggest red flags out there. For me, that's my daughter, even though she, she uh, misbehaves quite a bit right now. That's, that's my hope. You know, just like you all as, as parents can appreciate that. So there's three more, and we're moving along nicely. But just my, uh, I guess the, the teacher in me knows that I need to pause. I need to give people like a step back, right? So, and I, I, 30 seconds, Brian, help me out, 30 seconds. Strategies eight through four. Which one stood out for you? Which is the one that you could you think you could do tonight? It could be as easy as I'm gonna go take that values and action inventory tonight. I'm gonna tell my daughter tomorrow to what is hope? What does hope look like? So just pause thirty seconds. If you say nothing, that's okay. Great, I'm not getting any feedback tonight because the live audience, right? Um, just thirty seconds. Then last thirty. I hope, I don't hope, right? I'm just kidding. I, uh, I imagine that something stood out for you. That's awesome. I hope so. The last three, these are tough. I know what images are coming up. These are tough, 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 tough. People ask me, how is this image and this strategy connected to depression? Well, here's how. When we're depressed, uh, let me say I. I'm not going to put anybody in the category. Let me say, when I'm depressed, I'm very selfish in terms of, I'm just thinking about me and my emotions, how I'm feeling. I was so selfish that I asked my wife to take my daughter, who is the biggest factor in my hope, to give me some space for three days. That's how selfish depression makes me. And for a lot of people, depression is very isolated and we just... We don't do anything. We stop doing, stop doing things. But we now know that if we can do acts of kindness for 21 days, it becomes a habit that maybe will feel a little happier. I love this image because we all see what's going on in this image, right? Somebody is helping a person in a wheelchair not get it as, as soaked. So for you all, I would ask you this. And there's a lot of kids and adolescents in the room. Never t I haven't talked to y'all directly tonight. Um, just think, when was the last time you did an act of kindness? Besides washing the dishes or taking out the trash. Those aren't acts of kindness. Those are your responsibilities, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> acts of kindness is something that's beyond the ordinary. Something that's beyond the norm. When I went to go see my grandfather... That wasn't an act of kindness. That's something I did that I wanted to do. It was part of my norm. 
what about when I took Gamales to the staff who cared for him? That was something a little above and beyond. Two weeks ago, at lunch at McDonald's, and you know where I'm going with this, right? The drive-thru. The drive-thru at McDonald's with those two lines is getting a little out of hand. I've seen some <laughs> opposite of happiness. But anyway, I, 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 was, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, well, let me try it. I had never done it before. So I said, I asked the cashier. First, I asked him what they ordered. Make sure, you know, make sure it wasn't five number ones. Um, I actually did ask that. <laughs> but I asked him, what, what the person behind this order? My limit was, was, was 10. And I think they ordered at the time, it was a, a McRib meal. I don't remember, whatever, 7 49. And I said, all right, you know what? Let me, I'm going I'm to pay for them. And it was so cool because the gentleman, he went out of his way in his car to, to, to pass me. I had stopped at the front and he rolled down his voice. He just said, said, thank you. That was my act of kindness. I'm not the most creative person in the world. There's other less expensive and free versions of that. But just think, when you're doing an act of kindness, we stop thinking of ourselves and we're thinking of others. So the, to the kids in the room, think of something that would be kind to do for your parents that's beyond the norm of what you, you normally do. Think about that. Love this picture, last two. I know it's, the, the last one is gonna be tough. We all know Grumpy Cat. My, uh, my uncle, you know, uh, I'm sharing lots of stories, but I'm very authentic. My uncle used to have a partner who was very, very negative. He's one of those people who, beautiful day, he sees that one cloud in, in the northeast. Very negative, very negative. And he reminds me of this person, of or this cat, right, in this image. The image goes, what a beautiful day, let's go back inside now. Right? Very negative, very negative, very negative. The saddest part about this image is not a lot of people know this poor cat's real name, but anyway, <laughs> just grumpy cat. So this, this, this one is hunt the good stuff, right? HTGs. Everybody loves acronym these days. Hunt the good stuff. Here's what that looks like. Tonight, tomorrow morning, and then tomorrow night, every morning, ask yourself, what's good in my life right now? And that is very hard. And my family knows, and they can ask Alyssa, it is very hard when our daughter is not behaving at night. Very hard. But we always try at the end of the night to talk about what's one good thing that happened to us today. And tonight is one of those days that's going to be difficult because we're, uh, this, uh, my wife and I are on a grant that was rejected today. Hurts, 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 right? But what we try to do is every night, we hunt the good stuff. What's good? Why is it good? And the most important question, how can we create more of the good in our lives? I want to be respectful to all of you and, and children and, the, and, and your kids. Sometimes life is hard and there's not a lot of good. But you know what? I'll never forget when I was working with a client, and he was he was he was challenging. He was tough, and he told me there's nothing good in my life. And I let I I, I I'm not the most assertive person, but we went back and forth until he finally said the only good thing in my life right now is I have a mom and I have a, a house, a roof. Isn't that a start? When he was thinking nothing, 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 nothing. At least he identified two important things. So that's what I'm telling you. It is, not, it is not easy. I know life is hard. I know the, the news, some of the news, projects negativity. I know I'm not the most mindful and respectful person of what goes out in the world. I'm one of the people who, when my friends texted me about what happened in the political election a while ago, I made a joke about it. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm very difficult with that. But I always tell people, you know, we, we have to try to hunt the good stuff. As, as much as we can. Um, and even if it's just you all are here breathing, that's a start. That's a start. And here's the last one. You know, this one's tough, but you know what? What can you do, right? This one is, out of all of them, this one's number one because there's a lot of research to support it, right? So here's the adolescents in here. Easiest thing you can do, and I'm a, I'm a what's the, I'll, I'll say the word in a minute. 
We know that when people express gratitude for an extended period of time, they tend to feel happier, they tend to feel better, they express appreciation for others. And here's two easy ways we can do that. Number one, we can write a, a gratitude letter to our parents, to our teachers, to our school counselor, to whoever. Somebody asked me last week, I express gratitude all the time in a text with my emojis. I'm like, you know, that's not the same. It doesn't have the same meaning as a, as a written letter, right? And as you, if you recall, that was one of my main strengths. I think it was number two or number three. So when I'm doing well with mental health, I'm expressing gratitude to two people. And you all know this, I always, that's one thing my grandfather always taught me, especially when somebody cooks for me, he always told me to say thank you because However it tastes, it's probably better than what I would have made. <laughs> I would have cooked. But I always remember that. But here's the more powerful thing. So that, that's, that's, that's my mom. She lost her battle to cancer in May. Um, I, I, was, I presented all last semester at Keys Academy. At, last year at Keys Academy, I was talking about this, and I realized I wasn't doing what I was talking about. So I wrote a letter to her about two weeks before she passed. You know, she died of, of cancer. Which is, which is brutal. I wish somebody would have prepared me for what cancer does to somebody. Anyway, I wrote about a three-page gratitude letter. It felt so therapeutic. And the reason that was important because when I got married in 2011, <laughs> 2011 um, I wrote a gratitude letter to every guest that attended our wedding, except three people. My mom, and my cousin's brothers, Tomas and Esteban. And I did that because I knew writing a letter to them was a way of saying goodbye to all of our, our good moments. So what I'm here sharing with you is expressing gratitude is not as easy as it looks. It is brutal to put yourself in a frame, a frame of mind where you're acknowledging what other people have done for you. So one of my biggest regrets in life is I wrote the letter to my mom, but I did not read it to her. I was a, I don't know if I can say this, since I feel I have a PhD, I can do whatever I want, but I know I can. I don't know if I can say cowardly. I was a coward and I asked my grandmother to, to, to read it to my mom. Biggest regret, horrible. So those of you who are a little young in here, you know, if you ever write a gratitude letter, your parents would be so appreciative, you will read it to them. Make that, make that connection, put yourself in that position where you have to be a little vulnerable. It is brutal, it is tough, but now I have a habit of writing a gratitude letter once a month to, to certain people. Brianna and Derek are probably wondering where they're is. You're all on the list, <laughs> they're coming, they're coming. But I promise you, it is hard to write. I still haven't written a letter to my, to my cousin because they're, they're like my brothers, and I knew when I got married, it was saying goodbye to them in that part of my life. And I knew I was saying goodbye to my mom. So it's very hard. So you're probably thinking, how is it related to depression? It's related to depression in, in this way. When we express gratitude to others, we're thinking about the positive things that people have done for us. And it's very, it's so powerful, so therapeutic. Um, for us. Yeah, that's tough. So I know I'm probably about 10 minutes early. I do that intentionally so we can have a conversation at the end. <laughs> um, but here's the last, um, let's do one minute, Brown, all right, one minute. So you see up here, application. When I presented this about a month ago and they didn't, people didn't get it, so I'm gonna explain it. Application to me means how are you going to apply what you learned today to your personal life? That's, the, that's what that means. So for a minute, whether we're online or in here, just think about how can you apply what we talked about today to your life or to help your child's life?
All right, so I, I, I hope you all took away something. Even if it's something you're already doing, but now it solidifies what you're doing, you want to do more of it, you know, something. Uh, I, I just want to share a couple final, final thoughts. Um, if Ms. Bovada and ACIV gives good feedback, it's time to invite me back for three more dates. No, you're coming back. Okay, I'm coming back. <laughs> um, and I, I, I will say that I always add things based on, I know we're not having a conversation, but I promise you before this presentation, several people shared with me certain things. I'm always revising, tweaking things. There's always something new that comes up. So the next three dates will be March 25th, April 29th, May 13th. I think uh, I'm presenting in Harlem's room 14 times. Told my wife that our daughter's gonna start calling me Theo. That's all right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's well, <laughs> so well worth it. Um, so the final thing I want to share with you all is, I promise you, this um, this was a conversation. I know I lectured a lot because of the the, the online streaming, but I promise you, I, I'm not an expert. This was not an, uh, an expert approach. This was me as a humble parent and co-person in our in our journeys. And I just want to applaud all of you as parents because it, it, it is the hardest job I've ever had. Um, my three and a half year old, I worry about her a lot, but somebody reminded me that at least you know where your daughter is at night. And some parents have told me that, and I can reflect when I was a 16, that some parents have to worry if their child is coming home at night, if they're gonna be late for curfew things like that. So what I'm sharing with you is I can appreciate everything that you do as a parent. I love that y'all are here and I hope we just continue the conversation. So, so thank you. So as Dr. Cavazos mentioned, oh, you, are you still? Yes. Oh, okay. As Dr. Cavazos mentioned, um, we want to thank y'all for coming out. As he said, he will have three other sessions. He will be back. Um, you know, Harlingen, we do have, and, and please share with other parents, we do have students that are depressed, and sometimes, as he mentioned, you know, there is a stigma out there, and we need to break that stigma, because we really need to be here to help all of our students. Um, I would also just mention that we have counselors at every single campus, so if your child or you know of a child that is depressed or, you know, needs to visit with somebody, we do have counselors. We also have a resource list uh, for parents that if you need, you know, somebody else to go visit with to get more assistance, that we can provide that resource list to assist you um, and assist your child as well with whatever you all need. So thank you very much, and Dr. Colossus, you'll be here for a few minutes more.